My name is Miguel Del Valle. I'm the chair of the Illinois P20 Council. Uh, I'm also a member of the Advance Illinois Board. Um, and I'll throw in a couple of more. I'm vice chair of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission and also a board member of the Federation for Community Schools. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, welcome the legislators who are here today. And we're very appreciative of the fact that They've made time in, in their busy schedule during session, and I know we're competing with uh, many other activities here in Springfield this evening, but that's the way it always is in Springfield. There's never a perfect day when you have legislators all to yourselves. <laughs> um, so we really appreciate your, your, your presence here today, and I'd like to acknowledge the legislators who are with us this evening here. Uh, beginning with Senator William Delgado, who's the chair of the Senate <laughs> Education Committee. <laughs> Senator Heather Staines. <laughs> Senator Daniel Biss. <laughs> Representative Sandra Pijols. Representative Noreen Hammond. <laughs> Representative Catherine Clunan. <laughs> Representative Michelle Musman. <laughs> and we have other representatives who uh, were with us uh, and had to leave. Um, I hope we're not missing anyone. Well, Senator Oberweiss has just joined us. Welcome, Senator. And others with us, Senator Kyle McCarter. Representative Derek Smith. And Representative Jim Seisha. And Senator Lechtefeld. <laughs> Welcome. We also want to thank our sponsors tonight. Of course, uh, we begin with Advance Illinois, the CME Group Foundation, EdRed, the Illinois Association of School Administrators, the Illinois Education Association, the Illinois Education Legislative Caucus, the P20 Council, Illinois PTA, the Latino Policy Forum, Legislative Education Network of DuPage County, Ounce of Prevention, United Way, and Voices for Illinois Children. Thank you very much for sponsoring this important <laughs> event. I serve as chair of the Illinois P20 Council. Uh, the P20 Council was established by the General Assembly uh, to deliberate and make recommendations to the governor, the Illinois General Assembly, and state agencies uh, for developing a seamless and sustainable statewide system of quality education and support from birth through adulthood. Appointed by the governor, uh, university administrators, school boards, unions, nonprofits, teachers, business leaders, local government, colleges, and parents all sit on our committees working to smooth the path for our students from preschool to post secondary. We've set a goal in Illinois. Uh, that goal is that by the year 2025, 60% of our adults will have post secondary credentials. Certificates from community college, an associate's, a bachelor's degree. Today, only 29% of our current high school students are projected to earn a two to four year degree. So we have work to do. Currently, only 38% of Illinois students are college ready in three of four ACT benchmarks, English, mathematics, reading, science. This matters because high school students who meet three or more of those benchmarks are 75% more likely to earn a two or four year degree. 
Evidence and experience shows that when you expect more from students, they rise to the challenge. Illinois is committed to ensuring that every high school student graduates prepared for college and career. And today I was reading an article about this year being the 30th anniversary of the Nation at Risk report. And then I also saw a mention that, that it was 20 years ago that the public had access to the World Wide Web. That was a number of years, a number of years after that report was issued. In that report that shook the nation, uh, we were challenged. We were challenged to change things and to improve our educational system. Well, since that report, we've seen very, very slight improvements. But now, these days, with all the data being available that was not available during the time that that report was put together, uh, we see that, that when we compare ourselves to, uh, to other countries and we look at international benchmarks, we see that we have a ways to go. While there have been improvements in math and, and science, uh, we're nowhere near where we need to be. Now we have the Common Core, 45 states that have adopted the Common Core. Since the Common Core is focused, coherent, and provides a clear framework for what students should learn at every step of their education, today teachers can focus on developing the curriculum that best fits their students and support them in developing the skills they'll need to be successful in college, careers, and life. We're going to see tremendous improvements, I think. And so the next big report, national report that gets done, I think is going to show significant change in our, in our system of public education in the country. And that's what we're here tonight to learn more about, and that is the implementation of the Common Core Standards. Uh, I, at this point, want to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, she is Sandra Alberti. I think you're really going to enjoy this presentation, and please prepare your questions, because that's always the most interesting part of the program, the, the questions that will come afterwards. Uh, Sandra Alberti is the Director of State and District Partnerships and Professional Development for Student Achievement Partners. Founded by three of the contributing authors of the Common Core Standards, Student Achievement Partners is devoted to accelerating student achievement by all students by supporting effective and innovative implementation of the Common Core. Sandra joined Student Achievement Partners from the New Jersey Department of Education, where she served as the Director of Academic Standards and as the Director of Math and Science Education. In these roles, Sandra was directly involved in state standards, assessment, and professional development policy and implementation strategies. Sandra is an educator and has held several district level positions, including school superintendent, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, principal, subject area supervisor, and high school science teacher. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Rutgers University and master's and doctorate degrees in educational leadership from Rowan University. She has traveled the country speaking about the Common Core, and we are very honored to have her here with us today. Join me in welcoming Sandra Alberti. Thank you very much. Uh, it is certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, if you haven't heard, this is our fourth event in 36 hours uh, around the state, and it is really wonderful, as kind of my title uh, hints at, this uh, Director of State and District Partnerships and the Common Core, I do this work a lot. And um, when I first started having conversations with the folks here in Illinois about could I come out to the state, uh, I said yes and keep me busy and they certainly took me up on that offer. And so it is actually uh, my preference and now I have experienced what I thought was my preference, which is to come to a state, I reside in New Jersey still, 
and actually get a chance to talk uh, first to a group of philanthropists, many of whom I see today, and, and it's great that they're coming for a second shot of this. Uh, last night we had uh, a great meeting with parents uh, whose children will certainly be impacted by this work. Uh, this morning we had a wonderful uh, meeting in Arlington Heights with school district leaders, uh, and now getting to uh, share the information with all of you uh, and talking to you about how this um, may impact policy decisions made in the state and certainly all of you who support the children in Illinois um, helping to understand what the big hype is around Common Core uh, is an opportunity that I certainly appreciate having. So thank you all uh, for spending this time and hopefully um, you will find this information to be useful to you. I, like Miguel, look forward to the question and answer session. Uh, so so hopefully uh, this will spark some, some ideas. And thinking about things like the nation at risk and so on, um, you know, having been at this job for quite some time, I think we are ready to go beyond having a conversation in education to starting to talk about what's it gonna take to really make these changes happen. We've had a lot of great ideas, we've learned a lot along the way, and I think what Common Core state standards represent is kind of the culmination of a lot of learning that we've all experienced. So just starting off with, with where we were, and I understand that, that your state superintendent, uh, Dr. Cook, ha had a role in the, the early ideas of this, as I learned in our presentation this morning. This idea that we changed from, you know, taking a look at where our students are. So we've been talking about U.S. competitiveness in the world and how our students were or weren't doing the kinds of job that our graduates were able to uh, fulfill versus what was happening in other uh, countries around the world. We were really concerned about the high rates of dropouts and college remediation as we're all energized towards sending all of our students to some post-secondary education. We know that all too often what's happening is we're sending them to those institutes of higher education or trade programs or apprenticeships and they are not able to meet the most basic entry level requirements in those jobs. So you can imagine you know, the idea of a false promise that the high school diploma therefore represents. They've completed all their coursework, they've passed all their grades, they've completed the assessment requirements, they're ready for the next thing, but surprise, surprise, they're actually not ready, and they find themselves stuck in these situations. As hard as we've been working over the past four decades, the data shows us quite an interesting picture, as Miguel alluded to, very little improvement. We've almost tripled the amount of spending in education, we've lowered class sizes, We've increased research-based practices, and if we look at the National Assessment of Education Progress, we see a slight uptick in fourth grade performance, but eighth grade, over 40 years, no improvement, none. And in the limited assessment that we give in the NAEP in 12th grade, we actually see, despite increased investments, despite lower class sizes, despite research-based practices, a decline in student performance. And it's not that there's something in the water. It's not that our teachers aren't working really hard every day. It's that we're actually not focused on the things that actually matter for kids. And so what the Common Core State Standards gives us the opportunity to do is get back in touch with what this system under No Child Left Behind was supposed to do in the beginning, which was to really say that it should not matter what your zip code is. There is a minimum amount of education a minimum set of skills that should be guaranteed to every student. We couldn't do that before, not with the Illinois State Learning Standards, New Jersey State Standards, or any of the state standards, for a lot of reasons. One, there were just way too many things. And so typically how states develop these lists of expectations was in gatherings not unlike this. And each representative said, hey, I really believe kids should know this. And another person would say, hey, I really think kids should know that. And we would say, hey, listen, the meeting's ending in 15 minutes. So as long as you can all agree that we'll have everything in there, let's just go on. And no one really thought about what this would look like in practice. So someone once told me that if you took a look at the California state standards as an example, but the same is probably true at every state, it would take a teacher, a, a, a school system, 33 years to teach everything that was in those standards. So by design, we set up a system that could not drive instructional decisions. How do you guarantee all kids something that takes 33 years to even approach? 
And so instead, we end up with these systems that say, hey, do you want to know what's going on in your school? Just look at what the teacher's doing. Are they covering the curriculum? Is the pacing appropriate? But we never ask the question that this whole system was based on, which quite simply is, are students learning? We don't have time. We don't have time to say, are they in fact learning? Because if they're not, we're moving on anyway. 33 years of standards. We're moving on anyway. And so what these standards start off with is really thinking about what would the system look like if, in fact, it was driven by standards instead of standards being something we do for other purposes, let's just say like accountability. So these standards are built on these descriptive features. One is that they are a set of standards that by design had to be fewer in number. When we hand these standards to teachers at a grade level, they actually fit on one piece of paper. Those of us who have worked in education know how revolutionary that is. You know, I used to have a line item in my budget for every time I went to a meeting and I had to provide people with copies of the standards. They were, you know, spiral bound, you know, broke your back even carrying those things. But now when we hand te a teacher the standards and they all fit on one page, you can kind of wrap your head around that. You can kind of think about what that looks like for your kids in your class. So that was the first very critical, very critical feature of these standards. The second is that these were a set of standards that had to be clearer, that didn't just talk about, you know, some perhaps experiences, but really described in a very direct way what standards should look like, what performance should look like in the classroom. So my favorite example of this, just to give you some, some color to it, in New Jersey we had a standard, and you probably had it in Illinois too. Students in third grade will explore concepts of fractions. So you think, what does that look like? Hey, in my school it looked like a pizza party. You know, divided in eight, should we divide it in 12? What should we, do? we're exploring concepts of fractions. Not really getting kids ready for college and careers. But when you look at how these standards describe the expectations, it is much more specific because it is intended to be helpful to the teachers and the kids in the classroom. And then the third thing, which I just love talking to people about, is the fact that these are a set of standards that are in fact higher, not harder, but higher. And what it means in the world of standards to have higher standards is when you declare it, you in fact expect it. And so as an example, my daughter's in fourth grade this year, so I often talk about third grade. My mom is still a third grade teacher, so it's just the examples I typically go back to. In third grade, we have a standard that says by the end of third grade, all kids will fluently multiply within 100. That's right, the times tables are coming back. We don't just mean the top kids. We don't just mean the kids that come from two-parent households where both, kids went, both parents went to college. We don't mean kids who were born with that US phenomena that only exists in this country, which is you were born with a math gene. We mean all kids. We mean all kids. And that's, in fact, what it means to have higher standards, that you expect it for all kids. You obviously can't get there if you don't start off with a set of standards that are fewer in number. It is critical to this work, but it is, in fact, how these standards are designed. And the way we got to fewer standards, just to say, in the world of education, rare moment in time, we started with the evidence. Not what did we like to teach, what do we have fun activities around, what is it that kids are just used to doing, we've done the Apple unit every year for the past 50 years in this school, but what are the things that colleges, technical schools, trade programs are telling us kids need in order to be prepared? And we started with that. And the other thing that we so rarely do in education is that we were honest about time. So during the standards writing process, we've collected tens of thousands of comments from teachers, from professors, practitioners in the field, from parents. And every time they said, well, what about this? We took it under consideration and asked ourselves, is it worth less time on something else that's already in there? We didn't add to the school year, we didn't add more time, so every additional standard, which by the way doesn't cost any money to put in, that's how we got to these long lists to begin with, meant less time spent on the things that the evidence showed were necessary for kids. And so just to give you kind of an uptick story about this, as much as we've been begging in education for someone to be honest about time, 
We're very hesitant to let go of things in this industry, very hesitant to do that. So where we are around this nation, when this idea came about and the meeting started in Chicago, actually, governors, state superintendents getting together and said, so what do you all think about considering this agenda of instead of focusing so heavily on providing every kid with a diploma, that we actually think about college and career readiness? And rather than us all doing that separately, would you entertain the idea of evaluating these standards as your own state standards? And 48 of the 50 states said that they would consider it Obviously never Texas, and at the time, not Alaska. And the standards were written, and states had all kinds of opportunities to share them with various stakeholder groups, get comments and reviews. And where we sit now, very much to the surprise of the people who led this work, 46 states and DC have adopted these standards. And despite some interesting new rumbling about these standards, no state has yet to recede from that adoption. Despite, you know, whatever people might think, you know, public, you know, political party here, there, and everywhere, we are still honoring the work of the teachers who are working so hard at this, and this is still where we stand. And for those of us who are in education, this changes everything. Imagine you are a teacher who gets prepared in Illinois. You can teach in any one of these states, and you have learned a degree of specificity that you never before could have. You're teaching in Illinois. You can go to college in any of these states because the teacher preparation programs are working on a common agenda. You are a teacher looking for good ideas. You not only can go beyond the boundaries of your district, you can go beyond the boundaries of your state and find best practices in any one of these states because we are working on a common initiative. The other interesting phenomena that's happening out there is this idea of open education resources. So a great example of this is the state of New York, which is one of the big race to the top winners, decided to invest their resources in creating curriculum. We helped advise them on the design of that curriculum, knowing that that curriculum is available to every citizen of the world, actually, because it's freely available on the internet. That could not have happened before this initiative. So there is such a power in common that we'll spend some more time about. So I just kind of briefly want to touch on for you, what are the things that are changing? Because I think we need to get beyond this idea that when people think about Common Core, they just say, wow, we're making life harder for kids and teachers. What are we actually asking for? And all of this is, as I said, based in evidence of what kids need to be doing. Preparing for college and careers is no longer a 12th grade activity. It's no longer a high school activity. It's a way we need to build our education systems. So when we look at the changes that are happening in literacy, quite easily stated, not so quite easily done, but easily captured, here are some three big things that are happening. One, we're asking kids to read more nonfiction, to learn about the world around them, no matter what their upbringing is, no matter what their environment looks like, they can be studying any period of time in history, any region of the world through text. And it turns out learning from text is quite different than reading stories. And if kids are going to learn from text, they need to learn how to learn from text. So that's the first shift. We're not getting rid of the classics of literature. We still have that as a very important piece of literature education. But we are asking, starting at the earliest grades, for kids to read more nonfiction. It's important for their preparation. The second of the three shifts in literacy is asking kids to practice the skill, and I'm sure you'll all appreciate this, when making an argument, back it up with some evidence. Use evidence from the text. So too often in our schools, we ask kids things to like, reflect on your opinions and don't necessarily back it up. Do you want a garbage dump across the street? Do you think we should have school uniforms? That is not really the work that prepares kids, because I don't know how many of you are ever asked to make a case without supporting it with evidence, but rarely do we have that opportunity. So we're asking kids to practice. It is one of the things that puts kids in remedial programs in college, not that they can't do this, it's that they've never experienced doing this kind of activity. So a great example I can give you as an illustration of this is the difference between doing the challenging work of reading, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And rather than asking kids who have gone through that really hard process of understanding a dense piece of text to write an essay on, so have you ever experienced something that was unfair and what did you do about it? 
Rather than answering that question, which is interesting for a kid to write about, and quite frankly, interesting for a teacher to read about, instead asking them, what can you infer about the letter that Dr. Martin Luther King received based on what he wrote in his letter? You really need to understand the text, probably have the text right in front of you in order to answer that question. That's a college and career ready question that will actually buy students some skills, some confidence in the challenges that face them. Very different from the other question that all too often our students are experiencing. The third of these three things is also an interesting alignment issue. What we found in the research that informed these standards is what kids had to read, whether they were in a trade program, a technical school, or what have you, was significantly harder than what they were typically reading in high school. So in these standards, we have expectations from elementary school through high school about what kids should be reading. It doesn't just matter whether you can, for example, identify the main idea. If I can only do it with Dick and Jane readers, and you can do it with War and Peace. So we have to pay attention to what kids are reading, because research shows us that that's really an important challenge that kids are going to face in life after high school. So those are the three big things. There's more details on that. But knowing that tells you a lot about what's changing in literacy. In math, I am sure, just as citizens of this country, you have heard the idea that in this country, in math, we describe our curriculum as a mile wide inch deep. I'm growing increasingly fond of the way one of my uh, friends who teaches fourth grade in the state of Connecticut talks about this as the spray and pray method of teaching math. We just spray our kids with everything we can. We hope some of it will stick, but probably not, because we actually don't have time. And you know, my, I have two children who are uh, this year in fourth and second grade and experiencing math through their eyes. We right away start telling kids things like, it's tricky, it's hard, oh, you don't understand this, don't worry, Monday we're doing something new. That is how we teach math in this country. Because we have this laundry list of disconnected topics. So the first thing that these standards do is focus on fewer topics. Fewer things that kids learn at depth makes all the difference in the world. It gives teachers the opportunity to teach multiple ways, to reteach if kids don't understand, because too many of our kids go to the next grade and the next grade and the next grade with a very shaky foundation in math education. So these standards are built in such a way that their understanding builds from year to year in a developmentally appropriate way so that they can have a real math experience. We also talk about the idea of rigor in math. What does that mean? What does that look like? And just to say, in math, we care about three big things. One, kids need to understand math, not just the tricks. We have to rely on tricks as teachers because we don't have a lot of time to teach this stuff. But when you have time, you can actually teach math. So kids need to understand math. The second thing they need is some fluency. They need some things like the multiplication tables that they just know with speed and accuracy. And really important to all of us <laughs> is that they need to be able to apply their math to real world situations. Where problems come across all of our desks every day and no one says, do division here. They actually require that you understand that math exists in the real world and you need to be able to do that. So that's kind of the definition of the things that are changing in the standards. So, while I have the microphone, just to clear up some, some kind of misconceptions, perhaps misperceptions, about what the standards are and what they're not. They are not a national curriculum. As long as we have millions and millions of kids in this country, and as long as they don't look and act exactly the same, we will never have one way of doing this. And no one is saying that. What the standards are saying is that we should have this new minimum common expectation. And the way we teach that in one district versus another district, in one state versus another state, will always be variable. But it turns out in the world, as I said, in industries even outside of education, when you have a good set of standards, you actually create opportunities for innovation. So when we look at that map again, and we see how many teachers, how many states, how many school systems are working at this, boy, we really can go after best practices in a way that we never could before. We can share resources, we can share what we've learned, we can share communication strategies, best policies out there, all of these things because we are going after a similar outcome. 
We can't do it on exactly the same way. It's not the model we work on. We work with humans. It is never the case that standards lead to standardization. Anybody who believes that doesn't know what standards really are. We have safety standards. We have, you know, the underwriter laboratory standard. Does every appliance look exactly the same? Does every building look exactly the same? No way. We would be appalled if anybody would suggest that having safety standards or green energy standards would limit innovation. But in education, that seems to be the talk. And that's just really a misunderstanding of what this is about. When we think about the power of what it means that we have common standards, as I said, best practices, I feel quite privileged to be so immersed in this work, in case you can't tell. Um, and so one of the things that I'd love to share with you, and I shared this with the philanthropist that we met with yesterday afternoon, it is an interesting time. I've literally been in meetings in DC where the biggest investors across the country are talking to each other. They're thinking about how they can target their investments strategically so that if one works, for example, in early childhood, another one will work on higher education. Another one will work on supporting the technology needs in districts across the country. And they're working in a coordinated way that they never quite took the opportunity to do before. But even if I take a look at these 36 hours and the snapshot of the experience that I've had in talking to parents, talking to teachers, talking to philanthropists, talking to legislative leaders, we're all kind of rallying against a common cause, a common issue, based on the urgency of the knowledge that we now have, which is what it means to be prepared. And so that really does help us in a way that we could not have done prior. Very important is that we really see this as not one more thing to do. It actually isn't quite an exciting, passionate talk if all I said is, instead of the Illinois state learning standards, we're gonna have these new standards and they're common across the states. This is a much bigger initiative than just taking the old stuff, crossing out the old lettering system and putting in some new stuff. This is really about a fundamental shift in the purpose of education actually, which is to say it is our job as a community, as a society, to do what we can so that every one of our students graduates with options. Options that they choose, not that the system chooses for them, but that they in fact choose. And that's what this system is built upon. So here comes the big ask, what can you do? What can you do as policy leaders? What can you do in a leadership position in helping your state make this happen? First of all, going back to this comment of this can't be one more thing to do, we all need to think about how we talk about this in connection to all of the other reforms that are going on. And so oftentimes I speak in states and everyone thinks they're unique and they're not. And they say, and do you know we have new assessments? And do you know we have new models of teacher evaluation and teacher effectiveness and principal effectiveness all at once? And everybody thinks they're the only ones going through that. And I will tell you, they are all going through it. And I say to them, new standards, new assessments, new definitions of teacher effectiveness. You tell me which of those things you wanna decouple. You want new standards in the old assessments? New standards, new assessments, but let's talk in the old way about what it means to be an effective teacher. It is a lot of work going on at once, but it has to go on at once because this is a system that's actually changing. And in case you didn't know, schools typically aren't good at systems thinking. They typically aren't good at it. They see things as separate things because that's typically how we roll it out to them. We don't connect the dots for them. And so that's one thing that I would ask of you. Second of all, resources are precious. They always are gonna be precious. And we need to make sure that we know enough about these standards and what they are supposed to do in schools that we make wise investments. So a great story about this is there are people who would have thought that the people who led the authoring, I'll just tell you this was the biggest conspiracy theory going on in the state of New Jersey, that the people who led the authoring and then the adoption of these standards were next going to sell the textbook series, the curriculum, the PT, PD toolkit. You know, full disclaimer, I have nothing to sell. I don't accept honoraria for speaking. I this is just our job right now. So rather than selling you those things, what we have developed is the criteria of what it in fact means to be a good resource to purchase for Common Core implementation. We have states through the Council of Chief State School Officers who are collectively evaluating resources according to these uh, criteria. 
We have through the organization known as the Council of the Great City Schools, 32 of the largest districts in this country signing a pact that they will not invest a dollar in resources that do not meet these criteria. So if there was ever a question about whether or not the publishers would get on board and make the changes necessary to provide teachers with quality resources, we have the numbers. The educators have the numbers and we have seen significant changes in what this looks like. So asking people how their dollars are targeting and aligned to Common Core is an interesting opportunity that you have as well. And then again, focusing, so critical, rather than keep adding and adding and adding, helping people to focus on this initiative of college and career readiness, and that's really what this is all about. This isn't some dogma, this isn't some document that we want everybody hanging on their walls, but what are all the things that we need to think about in our education systems that are gonna help support college and career readiness. So great that we have so many organizations here that support the parent voice, that look out for the benefits of the children, because this is a big change. And it's going to take all of us to make this happen, and so much bigger and so much more important than just a new set of standards. So that's kind of my really quick presentation. Uh, I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, I, I want to uh, encourage you to begin formulating questions. Uh, the last part of the evening's presentation will include the question and answer with, with Sandra and with Chris, and we're going to introduce Chris in, in just a minute here. Um, I encourage you to write your questions in the next couple of minutes, and uh, there are pads uh, and pencils on, on uh, each table, so please uh, make good use of them. I also want to uh, recognize that we are joined by um, State Board of Education member Melinda Labar. Melinda, thank you for joining. And by uh, Representative Cynthia Soto. I now would like to bring up uh, Jamie Parisi who will uh, introduce Chris. Uh, Jamie Parisi has served as Chief Financial Officer and Senior Managing Director, Finance and Corporate Development of CME Group since uh, February of 2010. Prior to assuming his current role, he served as Managing Director and Chief Financial Officer. He joined the company in 1988. Jamie? First, wow, what uh, passion that we saw from Sandra. That was uh, really inspirational for me. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you uh, tonight. Uh, as the world's largest futures exchange, CME Group brings buyers and sellers together through its trading floors in Chicago and New York and our data center in uh, places like Aurora and our Globex electronic trading platform, uh, which now reaches customers in 150 countries around the globe. With more than 2,000 direct employees in Illinois and an estimated 135,000 Illinois jobs tied to the exchanges in Illinois, CME Group serves as a major global hub of price discovery and risk management in a wide range of commodity and financial products. We look to Illinois students of today to be technologists, analysts, and other skilled workers that will fuel the risk management markets of tomorrow. CME Group Foundation's mission is to enhance economic opportunity by supporting academic initiatives uh, and activities that promote the health and education of young children, promote the education of disadvantaged children, and promote research, teaching, and learning in financial markets. The Foundation is pleased to support and partner with Advance Illinois on its important outreach uh, work that they've done to communicate the importance of the Common Core state standards to parents and communities throughout the state. Today, more than ever, businesses like CME need employees who are well prepared to succeed as innovators in the global marketplace. CME Group Foundation supports implementation of the college and career alignment Common Core learning standards because we believe that these standards lay the foundation for preparing Illinois students to compete in the global economy and in turn help to ensure that Illinois remains a global economic hub. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, 
Dr. Christopher Cook. He was appointed by the State Board of Education to serve as Illinois State Superintendent of Education effective December 1, 2006. Dr. Cook has been with the Illinois State Board of Education since 1994, serving in a variety of administrative capacities, including Director of Special Education and the State's Chief Education Officer. As State Superintendent, Dr. Cook has led efforts to bring coherence between state standards, curriculum, assessments, and college entry requirements in Illinois through, through state membership in the American Diploma Project and the 21st Century Skills Initiative. He has been a strong proponent of using data to inform policy and is working to establish a data system where pre-K to 12 student achievement of data can be linked to post-secondary education and careers. Dr. Cook is a member of the Council of Chief State School Officers and served as president of this organization of his peers in 2010 through 2011. Superintendent Cook is an Illinois native, graduating from Brown County High School in Mount Sterling, Illinois, and from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. He obtained his master's and doctoral degrees in educational policy and leadership from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cook to the podium. Good evening, everybody. And the, Sandra is a hard act to follow in talking about Common Core. And I'm going to keep my comments brief as a result of that, just cover a few, a few of the issues perhaps that uh, we can cover a little more deeply. I want to first thank you all for being here tonight to talk about this important topic. I do look at Common Core as one of the most important historical evolutions in education in my lifetime. It's huge. And, and it's, it's, all, it's, it's huge because of all the reasons that Sandra laid out, because these standards are so important in laying the groundwork for what's coming in the future and for the work we do collectively as states. And a little story about those original uh, uh, conversations. Um, we were at a Chief State School Officers meeting uh, in Washington and a couple of us, we were all going through this idea of reviewing our standards. In fact, in Illinois, before these were even a sieve an idea, uh, Susie, uh, or my Deputy Superintendent Susie Morrison is joining me tonight, we were sitting down with faculty uh, from higher education and from high school. We had math faculty at the high school level and math faculty at the higher ed level and we did the same with language arts to talk about what it really meant to be career and college ready because that was a good idea and it was the right thing to do. And we were trying to address the problem of remediation. In many of these other states we were doing the same thing and I talked to a couple of other my colleagues and I said, you know, we should just have an ad hoc meeting and see if there's any interest. And I was talking, Gene Wilhoyt at the time was the executive director of the council and word got around, we thought we would have two or three uh, state superintendents who came into the room, and there were over 30 people who showed up at that meeting within an hour's notice to say, this makes incredible sense. We are wasting a lot of state resources independently reinventing what we know is good for kids in the long run. This will help our students who are going from Illinois or from Indiana. And think of it, a fourth grader in one state going to fourth grade in another state and actually having some coherence in what their learning would be and some map and outline uh, of what to follow. So it made a lot of sense to states instantly. We saw the potential of what would happen uh, and what could happen. Um, I want to, in my address tonight, I'm going to do two things. One, um, as all state agencies in education K-12 do, we're going to give you a test. Just kidding. <laughs> Calm down. I am going to demonstrate for you what a couple of the standards might look like in an assessment. I know a lot of times we jump in talking about standards to assessment. There's a really important step in between that, which is instruction, and, and, and instruction aligned to these standards. So we can't forget that. But I know there's a lot of anxiety about that. And is there a clicker? Am I missing it? Or is somebody clicking for me? You'll do it for me perfectly. We'll go to the next slide. This is already covered by Sandra really well, just in terms of the system, what we're adequately doing. Miguel touched on these points in his, uh, in his remarks. Um, so we'll, we'll breeze through that. So just looking at a grade seven, seven uh, sample item, uh, just to illustrate, and, and we're getting you know, a lot of teachers involved. At three years ago, when we first started talking about this, one of the first things we did was a gap analysis from the prior standards to the current standards. We saw the largest gap, quite candidly, in math 
in elementary math in the early grades. Uh, and so we were concerned about that. We immediately targeted uh, some of our professional development there. Less of a gap in English language arts, but there were some. And we immediately started thinking about you know, how that could be done. So you see the directions here. One thing I want to point out here, you'll note at the bottom something sort of familiar, talking about fonts and, and some fairly uh, familiar icons to us if we're working on our laptops or our computers. Uh, this is going to be an online assessment. We're getting a lot of questions about technology, technology infrastructure, how can we build up to that. And that is a significant uh, gap we have here in the state of Illinois that we're concerned about, we're thinking about. We have some real capital needs there. There's three points of connections. First, making sure everyone's connected to broadband, bringing in the technology to the school door, and finally to devices and devices that students would be using. Um, and we just have a lot of a variance in the state. I was in Itasca to the honor roll uh, ceremony just this past week. Uh, elementary district, the superintendent took me into a classroom and it's not uncommon. Here's our computer lab. There's 30 computers. I've got 900 kids. Do the math and we're not wired. Even though you can go to the Starbucks down the street and completely do anything you want here in the building, that's absolutely not the case. That's not an unusual circumstance. So um, here we have talking about Amelia Earhart. Uh, what the student's going to be doing, writing an essay, uh, remember to use textual evidence, all the things Sandra was referencing you'll see then employed in an assessment situation. We can bump ahead uh, also just looking again, three claims, you're getting the student to think critically about what they're seeing, what they're reading, how would they respond to this, a different skill set, um, highlight the claim that's supported by the most relevant and sufficient facts, click on two facts within the order, click. We can't be introducing the technology in an assessment as the first time the student experiences it. So we need to be already engaged in instruction and in using technology in the state before we move to any sort of, of assessment uh, situation. Move one ahead. We have the third part. Seems reasonable. Seventh grader, seventh graders can do this. I think they can. I think they can. We'll go to a, a math sample. Um, kids, all human beings learn through all modalities, which is a really cool thing about the carbon-based units we call humans. Uh, you'll see more em employment of those modalities in an assessment like this. Um, students like the application of knowledge and skills. It makes it real for them. It helps them to remember things. Um, this is a fraction task. Um, it's a soybean. It's an important Illinois agriculture product selected here for this presentation, um, which there'll be a lot planted because planting is going to be late. Yes, I was a farm kid and know a little about it. Um, so unlike traditional multiple choice, they're going to be manipulating the soybean to represent three quarters. There's not always one answer to this. There's more than one way to do it. But you get the students thinking about how they can answer questions and what those might look like. You can go to the next one. I'm going to type a fraction different than three-quarter in the boxes that also represents the fractional part of the farmer's field that is planted with soybeans. So they can't just eliminate, they can't guess, they don't have a 25 percent chance necessarily of getting it right. They're going to have to apply. And then finally, you can go to the high school sample item, two possible solutions, and you see ways in which the student can be doing this. So. Um, if I'm traveling around the state, which I do often, and we hear from teachers, we hear from administrators right now, you're hearing from them, I'm sure, there's a lot of anxiety around change. As Sandra mentioned, another thing to know, another initiative, another change, and at times when funding has been decreasing in the state. That anxiety is real, it's palpable, you can feel it everywhere you go. Um, with Common Core, uh, I do see this as a priority. Will districts will make this a priority and think about it. It's important because it's foundational. As Sandra said, it's hard to do things in isolation when you're talking about what are you instructing and the standards you're basing that on, how you're going to assess that, how you're going to evaluate teachers against instruction. It does all fit together. Um, we have been surveying teachers in Illinois. Uh, we have an online survey, uh, IFT helped facilitate that in IEA, and we appreciate their involvement. There's a, wide, there's a lot of teachers, more than you would think, who are feeling, first of all, very positive about the standards for all the reasons that were mentioned in that there were fewer, higher, and clear. They're not overwhelmed by this broad, expansive standards. Um, 
and also uh, they do feel like they are getting ready to implement. We have a fairly high, so far on the survey, about 80% who feel e either nearly ready or fully ready to be able to implement. Again, that's not all teachers. It's a sample of teachers of about 12, 1,400 teachers so far, but it's an early indicator that we are getting through to a lot of the uh, instructional force across the state around this. Sandra mentioned higher education. I saw uh, Dr. Harry Berman here somewhere this evening, the, the executive director. Harry wanted to recognize you. Uh, we've been working very closely with our higher ed counterparts uh, in this whole plan of implementation. And it's very important, uh, Sandra referenced teacher preparation, that the teachers coming out of institutions are ready to deliver to the Common Core. We've been working very hard on that, thinking about that in advance now for a couple years about the readiness of teachers. I just visited Knox College on Friday, uh, meeting some students, prospective students, going to watch the schools in Galesburg who were actually teaching these students who had gone in and became teachers. Um, they, are, they are aware of the Common Core. I was asking them a lot of questions. They're excited. They do see this as helpful to their teaching uh, in simplifying what they do and providing a focus. Uh, so I feel very positive about the work we've done with higher ed and Harry's, and, and, uh, Harry's help and leadership in directing them. And I think that's an important link, both at the community co college level and at the uh, higher ed level. We're, by the way, meeting quarterly with all the presidents of all the institutions in Illinois. Um, as well as all the college deans of education um, and, and trying to make sure that they share the excitement that we have around the Common Core standards and their implementation, which is so critical. Um, so uh, with that, let's see, we have one, this is just some resources we have available uh, and I'll end with this slide to support implementation. We have a very active website. I was meeting with this, uh, a, a, an Illinois company today who said they were very pleased about our our website, the resources we have. We have content area specialists to cover area, every, every area of the state of Illinois. And uh, we've been working again for a couple of years prioritizing uh, needs, and we've been doing that in tandem with, with the teachers' unions, and again, express my appreciation for that. So I can't wait for the questions, uh, and I know you've got a lot of them, and I will now turn it over to Robin for those. And thank you again. We have a, actually a few other folks we should acknowledge as well. Representative Jacobson, I know, is here this evening. Representative Soto, I don't know if we had a chance to catch you when you came in. Uh, Representative Kozel and Representative Cavaletto and Representative Harris. So, welcome, welcome. All right. I don't think we've gotten fewer than about 3,000 questions at each of these places, so I'm going to do my best. You guys are being a little bit lighter on that, so you're going to want to either drink a little more or write a little more or both. Um, I will try to bundle them so that we can get through as many as possible, and thank you guys for both um, coming up. But the first question I'll kick is to um, actually either one of you that wants to hit this. What's the timeline for the new assessments rolling out? We're a there are two national consortia. We're a member, a governing state in the yeah. park consortia. But tell us what we can expect in terms of the timeline here in Illinois. Sure, and uh, make sure this is on. So 2014-15 is the implementation. There are two uh, consortia, assessment consortia. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education is funding assessments aligned, the development of assessments aligned to the Common Core. The two uh, consortia, one is Smarter Balance, uh, the other is PARC. We are a governing board state in that. 2014-15 uh, is when they hope to have these assessments online. These will be through, through course assessments, so different than a one uh, testing window scenario that we're currently accustomed to. There will be multiple uh, testing venues throughout the year. Um, it's designed, one of the things you get with an online assessment uh, are results back quickly, which school districts want. That makes sense to them. They can actually use information then to better calibrate uh, instruction as they go forward. Um, the last two assessments will be the summative assessments that would count in terms of an accountability system. So that's in general the time frame. Also, there will be paper pencil version. They're discouraging use of that, understanding that some states, uh, and perhaps ours, will have to utilize a paper pencil. Uh, but we want to be thinking about technology for certain. I'm going to follow up with that because I, I know that the online portion of this is probably part of the answer to this question. And um, Chris, I would love you to start the question, but then Sandra, given the fact that you've seen how this is happening nationally, would love to get your take on this as well. But what do you believe are the necessary components for Common Core to be successful in Illinois? And what are the possible stumbling blocks so that and then what can we do to potentially avoid those? Yeah, I mean, to be successful, I think having a familiarity uh, with, with our workforce, who currently will be 
implementing these in the classrooms is, is key. I mentioned the importance of our new workforce, our, our workforce coming into play, having that address so we're not always playing catch up with professional development that folks actually leave a teacher training institution ready to implement. Uh, I mentioned technology is a barrier. I think that's real. Uh, I think that's something that we have a lot of work to do on in this state. Those are some initial thoughts. Sandra, I'll pass to you. Great. Uh, thanks. So from my kind of purview of, of looking at this state, one of the things that I think is really important, I'm really encouraged again by, by uh, the mobilization, the commitment uh, in the state of Illinois, and, and really realizing that this doesn't rest solely on the shoulders of the teachers and the classrooms across the state, but that this is going to take a community effort. That being said also, I think there is a huge uh, need to communicate that this isn't you know, a zero to 100 initiative, that this is something that is really important, it is going to require some significant changes, but we don't just flip a switch and think that we're going to be there. Um, I. Um, often talk to, to teachers about not even using the term, I've been trained in the Common Core. What this whole initiative is about is focusing on great teaching and great learning, and that's a forever thing. We're continuously gonna make better and better progress on that. We need to insist on that of our school systems, of our districts, of our states, but not to underestimate the amount of work that's gonna happen. So we should absolutely be committed to looking for signs of progress, but realize that this isn't an easy thing to do. We are changing a system here. And so one of the things that I hope that we can all continue to be engaged about is how we continue to collect data, making sure we're making good progress, but continue to give support as necessary. I know you hear this uh, all over the place, where, wherever you travel, Sandra. But how are students, ELL students, and students with disabilities going to be affected by Common Core? Because it's wonderful to hear, you know, if we if we if we narrow the focus in math to fewer things, that we really get the self time to make sure every child gets where they need to go before they move on. How does that affect students who may have some additional um, uh, learning disabilities and or other challenges? So, so one of the things that I always say when I uh, is that this isn't an issue created by the Common Core state standards. And I think all of us who have you know, high levels of concerns for both English language learners as well as students with disabilities need to realize that we have not served those students well in our current system. So this isn't like, oh my gosh, we're putting Common Core in place, those poor kids, now what? Uh, and so you know, I can say kind of a different answer. One thing that is just another great opportunity of Common Core is that the leading thinkers in this nation are really uh, mobilized around this. So particularly for English language learners, we have a great uh, task force coming out of Stanford University with the leading educators, leading researchers in how language is developed, who are promoting resources, white papers, doing all kinds of things. Uh, I will say absolutely, it is probably the number one issue out there in the country right now is what about these English language learners? And what we know is that too often they are left behind, they're kept behind because we haven't given them access or opportunity to approach these grade level expectations. So we were at a convening of publishers at one point uh, in time and a publisher came up and approached my uh, former boss David Coleman and said, so listen, my job is to publish resources for English language learners. Are you telling me that I have to do more than just provide picture books for those kids now? And so this idea of providing access to quality texts for all kids, including English language learners, is a big piece of the equity issue behind this. For students with disabilities, there is a lot of detail in how these standards are actually developed, that they are built on this concept that what you learn in second grade, in fact, builds to the next grade, in fact, builds to the next grade. And I spent part of my career also as a director of special services, where every year I could look at these kids' individual goals, and it was always telling time, counting money, telling time, counting money. Instead, now that we have really knowledgeable understanding of what expectations could be, we're working much better at supporting kids in what it takes to meet the skills and understandings, particularly in math, particularly in literacy, that will pay off in dividends, even for kids with disabilities down the future, instead of just keeping them busy, as we all too often have done. 
on the teacher side. So are there teachers, right now, for those of you, if this wasn't clear, there are, there are new Common Core standards for English language arts, and there are new Common Core standards for math. Some new ones have just been released around science, but those haven't been adopted yet by most states, including Illinois. How do you involve, and what's the right way to involve and incorporate and include teachers who are not teaching ELA, English language arts, or math? Well, how does this speak to them, and how, how does it impact them? Yeah, and I might just add to the, to the last question, too. You know, the majority of students, so let's say I'm a special education teacher, which I used to be. <laughs> the majority let's of, just suppose let's just you suppose. have a background in that. Okay. A long time ago. We're with you. Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the majority of students who have disabilities only learn differently. They have learning disabilities. They're learning differently. Or they have behavior problems, the second highest category. So historically, what we've done is take a lot of these kids away from curriculum. Uh, so as a special educator, we really needed to make sure they were getting access to curriculum because they weren't going to make up deficits as our data has shown they haven't done adequately. We still have an achievement gap in Illinois that's unacceptable for both English language learners and students with disabilities, but you don't get there by removing them from curriculum. So that has to be something that every individual in the school is thinking about. It's not to say that we want you know, the music teacher to just abandon all music and start teaching English language arts and math. That's not what this is about. But it is about ensuring that we're thinking about these kids and what they need to be successful in college and careers. A lot of students love courses like uh, music and art because they're able to apply what they learn and, and demonstrate, uh, how, how demonstrate and show how they're learning. That's why students get excited about those types of things. Well, that was good, that was impassioned, and I know that comes from the heart and your background experience. But let's go back to those teachers who are not teaching English language arts or math. And how are they going to, you know, does this not infect them? How does this, you know, are they sort of off to the side? How, what's, what's the right way for schools and districts to think about um, as they're incorporating Common Core, how they speak about that to teachers outside those two basic subject areas? Well, I think, I mean, in Illinois, you mentioned, for example, science. And so I'm a science teacher. I'm thinking about where these new standards are there. And in fact, teachers have been involved in those development. They might be excited about them. I think we have to think about the cadence with which we're doing things, how quickly. Um, but the social studies standards also need to be looked at. I mean, we're looking currently at PE standards. I mean, there's, we have to, standards are not something that should be static, that are, are, are developed at one point in time. And, and not dealt with. And I think all teachers have to be thinking about what they're teaching, how they're teaching it, uh, and, and that, in fact, we, re we will be vis revisiting these and ensuring that they're up to snuff, that they're internationally benchmarked, that they're relevant, and that they're actually enhancing learning. And, and just the only other I think does kind of bring everybody into the fold uh, is, as I said earlier, this initiative is about preparing kids. And so whether you are an arts teacher, whether you are a science teacher, a social studies teacher, or a PE teacher, you're not just there to keep kids busy. You're there to get them ready for something, to experience something, to enhance the well-roundedness of their experiences. And that means something. And so that is something that I think we should all um, be reminded of. Uh, it was well received last night in Oak Park when I kind of gave my opinion about music and arts education that we don't want to stop kids from doing art and doing music. That is not what this is all about. Instead of doing a painting, reading about a painting, no way. But instead of a teacher lecturing to you about a period of art history, if it's already in your curriculum, or about the you know, life of a particular artist, if it's already in your curriculum, let them use a piece of text to build knowledge about that. But we should never take away the purpose of a well-rounded education. That is not what this is intended to be. The Common Core State Standards are a piece of this whole college and career ready initiative, but it is not everything. So with the focus on these, these academic skills, um, can you talk a little bit about the degree to which and how the Common Core Standards help improve critical thinking skills, creative problem solving, and that dimension of, of higher order skills? So the standards themselves um, are more narrow in scope, but much more, de much more deep, much deeper in what they actually expect kids to do. So it was part of night my nightmare when I sat in the position at the New Jersey Department of Education that when I was able to provide teachers with the standards on one page, they would say, oh, it's January, we're done with math now, what's next? But this idea that what you can get in return for a focus on fewer things 
is an incredible depth of knowledge that students should be talking about math, talking about texts, you know, having conversations, all those things that so many of us as teachers say, if only, if only I had time to do these things with my students. And now is the time, not just for the best and brightest kids to have access to the opportunities for deep thinking, but for all kids. So, you know, all too often we talk about critical thinking and deep learning as separate and apart for, from content. And so one of the things that the Common Core State Standards set out is that is actually the way you learn content, not as something that you save at the end, go through the rote things, and then we'll give you this opportunity to do an application problem. But that's how you get stronger at both the literacy skills and the math skills is through these deep opportunities for learning. The implications for teacher education. Um, you know, to what extent are you seeing as you look across the country and Dr. Cook as you're looking across the state that teacher training programs and teacher education programs are adjusting to Common Core and what does that actually mean? Well, there's a number of things I'm observing and I think, again, positive. I think just as we're talking about, uh, you know, common standards in which students would be meeting, we're talking about common standards also that teachers need to meet. I mean, it is a profession. It's a profession that we want to make more professional. Uh, than it has been historically that we want to recruit individuals to. So I think it's caused, there are, you know, there are in-task standards, there's standards now that we're looking and thinking about teachers and what they need to know and be able to do. So I think that's a very positive development that's come uh, from the Common Core. Uh, I, you know, I, I believe uh, I'm hearing a lot of programs uh, with more focus on clinical experience. We know that's so important to the preparation process and I think uh, again, that becomes more relevant if, you're, if they want to see what's it look like to teach to the Common Core. It, or is there some place like I've had many teachers ask, are there a video that we could look at and see how this actually looks? Um, so I think those are some of the implications I would think about. And this is another one of those opportunities practices across the country. So for sure, uh, even though we don't always like to, to get hyper-focused on bits of data, when 23 states are taking a common assessment, we're going to be able to look at places that are showing pockets of success and where were those teachers prepared and what is it about that program that was best supportive of that work. Uh, so that's a really interesting opportunity. But I would also, you know, thinking about this idea of increased emphasis on clinical experience, I think we all need to kind of breathe through this and realize that after four years or five years of a teacher preparation program, you're not actually done. You're not actually ready. So I worry about this idea of, you know, just open up the lid, pour in all the Common Core, set them out into the classrooms and they're ready. But what we really need to be focusing on in promoting quality teacher preparation programs are what is the habits of continuous learning? You know, my favorite topic of how do they learn how to reflect on their own practice? So what are these habits that are so important to the profession of teaching? Because Common Core, like all good teaching and learning, is more than just, you know, pass on, you know, fill them with this information. And so I hope as we look at these standards and expectations that we make room for that part of it as well. Uh, Chris, that we this is going to be an online set of assessments and through assessments. And so the, the technology implications for a state as big and diverse as Illinois are pretty significant. Can, and you touched upon this a little bit, but can you maybe expand a little bit? What is the state of readiness? here in Illinois to hit that technology and that what's it going to take to get there? Yeah. Uh, so we're just now doing what's called a speed test uh, of, of actual buildings in the state to find out the readiness. We did, there was a, a park instrument that we surveyed initially, um, which didn't show a great de degree of readiness across the state. It was mixed. And we're now doing a speed test to find out what exactly each building's capacity would be for this type of, of, of assessment and instruction. Um, we're going to have the results uh, mid-May here, just in a couple weeks uh, of that. Um, I should also mention in relation to technology, uh, we have a shared learning uh, collaborative that um, Carnegie and Gates have been funding. Illinois is one of five pilot states in the country for this. It's being piloted currently in Bloomington Normal. And I'm very excited about the prospect of this because it's, it's, it's what it's, be, what, again, the Common Core enabled our uh, Common Core aligned materials to be shared among states, readily available to every teacher, regardless of where you are, in an open sourced environment. So if I'm a teacher and I'm uh, encountering problems and working with a particular student, I can, I can work with other teachers anywhere and find out what was successful in helping those students' uh, needs be met. The key here is to identify as soon as possible 
uh, learning problems that the student's having and address them as quickly as possible. Um, this is going to lead to a future of, of a potential of personalized learning, which as a former special education teacher is a real great idea. Um, being able to bring resources to bear quickly to chart and quickly see students' progress in response to those interventions. I think that has applications for everything, from teacher training to how we're doing instruction every day. All right, so if you were talking to, there's, there's been, and I, I'm, I'm gonna repeat the question, but I'm gonna give it a little bit of framing. There has been some rumbling of late, um, and, and it's been associated to some extent with the Tea Party Republicans of sort of concern that there's, this is an, an effort, you were speaking to this a little bit, to impose a national curriculum. So the question here is, if you were talking to a Tea Party Republican, what talking points would you give them to persuade them why this is a wonderful, wonderful move for Illinois? Sandra, why don't you take the first crack at that? that there used to be a time when it was the ultimate conservative education platform that we should raise standards and accountability. And now that we have done that in a bipartisan way, you know, the ultimate conservatives are coming out against it. You know, on the one hand, I think about what has happened in response to some of these grumblings, and some of the most conservative education leaders, including Bill Bennett himself, has come out absolutely in support of the Common Core State Standards. So on the one hand, you can be thankful that this is allowing people to really, you know, kind of come out and say, hey, actually, I'm a Republican and I support this kind of thing. But what I would say um, to, to those, you know, and I will maybe overgeneralize to say uninformed um, people, because they're, when I look at their platform, and I can't yet get to the point where I don't read it. So I do read what they're saying, and they typically say there, there's an interesting few things. One is that this comes from the federal government, that this is overreach on state, you know, local control of this. And so, you know, you have a state superintendent here who told you what really happened, how this really evolved. No states had to do this. They could have all pulled out of it at any point in time, and yet you still have 46 states who just said, this makes sense, and that's one thing. No one has forced us to do this. The second thing that we often see in a lot of these things is this idea that this is promoting a national curriculum, uh, a one-size-fits-all, you know, we're over, you know, tagging our kids, we're going to create these tracking systems that kids get put in these pathways. And again, if you know what standards are, if you know what the idea of holding kids to an outcome expectation, if anybody thinks that there's ever going to be one system to get kids there, they don't quite understand what we just talked about, which is what standards are. They are knowledge and skills that kids need. They are the floor, they are not the ceiling, but they are the guarantee that we should give our kids as a result of experiencing an American K-12 education. And then the third thing, just because it's almost funny, is that people are talking about in these very strategic talking points that miraculously are so similar state to state, is that this is about creating kind of this, you know, barcode stamp on each kid that we'll be able to have data that tracks kids every move they make, every breath they take, and that's what the Common Core is all about. You know, we've heard this happen in other countries maybe, that there are these theories out there, but it's not what the Common Core is about. Could such a thing happen? Maybe. Common Core doesn't make that possible or impossible, but it's just actually a distraction of this work. So when I hear this kind of thing, I think about the teachers. The teachers who are going to workshops, reading things online, spending time looking at their lesson plans, analyzing the data of the students in their classroom, and think what a shame it is that they have to answer about these things. Instead of people really supporting the work that they know they should be doing for their kids in their classrooms every day. And so just from a strategic point of view, the way we think about this often is pretty soon, we're gonna run out of talking points and, and people are gonna quite quickly tire of hearing me give this talk everywhere. And what we need is for teachers to be the ones giving this talk. And when people say, what is the Common Core? What does it mean? I want my friend who's a fourth grade teacher to tell you what it meant when she focused in math and her kids learned more math than she ever thought they could. Or special education students who were able to finally access on grade level materials. English language learners who given time and given support were able to read the same text that their grade level peers were. That's what this is about. There's no conspiracy theory here. It's interesting to talk about. It gets press, but it's not what this is about. And maybe that's what I would say. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. We may not let you leave. Um, so
everybody pers persuaded. We're excited. This is starting to roll out. We've got folks from schools and districts um, here today, and w it people are starting to implement and to try and make adjustments and adaption um, at the classroom level. What are we doing, um, Chris, to support those teachers? What kinds of issues are cropping up? And what is it that the state can do and is doing to make that transition as productive and smooth as humanly possible? Yeah, well, I mean, early on, I mentioned we've done a gap analysis and sort of targeting where do we have, where are our teachers mo practicing standards that are most different from those that are coming, and that was early math. So we focused on that. We've put together a leadership cadre of teachers and administrators who can talk about this. Uh, we have, as I demonstrated on the map, a region set up. We've been surveying teachers. Um, we've been, there's a lot of material, Susie could tell you better than me, that we have available uh, on our website for everyone, and a number of presentations across the state answering questions, uh, listening to what the concerns are, um, folks wanting to see lesson plans, wanting to see how this is operationalized. Those are common questions that we get uh, currently about Common Core and what the assessment will look like. Let me sidebar for a minute for those who are interested, um, interested that the materials, the, both the slideshow as well as relevant websites that have been referenced here tonight will be coming out to people who attended tonight. You'll be getting that next week in a follow-up um, email. So just know that's there. So there's really good online free materials at Student Achievement Partners and through their site links to elsewhere. So for those of you um, and with lots of different hats on, I think you might find that helpful and useful. I'm gonna have a last question, unless anything else comes in, I'm gonna have a last question then I'm gonna close. My last question is, how does this, how does, you know, what we're doing, this move to try and have some common set of expectations about what kids need to know and be able to do ultimately to be college and career ready, how does that compare to other countries? Are we, are we late to the party doing this? Are we early to the party doing this? Are we right somewhere in the middle? How does this compare to what particularly high performing countries, how they approach the question of standards? So, so, so it is a, a, the typical thing that we learned in international studies that this question of shared expectations throughout is true. I mean, you, you quickly lose people's interest when you start talking about international benchmarking because they right away say, but we teach a more diverse population than the typical, you know, other high-performing countries do. Those kids go to school six days a week. Those kids, you know, those parents support educators. Teachers make more money. They're trained differently. They have more time. And so this is a piece of the system that we're changing uh, that is more closely aligned. It's not the only thing that we need to change in this country in order to have a system like that, and I'm not sure that we should. It turns out a lot of these high-performing countries have taken a lot of our ideas as well. Um, but as far as a common set of expectations that everyone learns about, that is very much the case in most of these high-performing countries. In addition to the design, uh, I'll say breakthrough, of focusing on fewer things. So just to throw out a very real example, uh, just to share with you, one of the assessments that kind of gives us this information about how far behind the U.S. is falling, particularly in math and science, is known as the TIMS assessment, the Internet Trends in International Math and Science Study. And so out of the 35 countries that take that, we're somewhere around 28, 31 in some you know, administrations on this assessment. In math, the U.S. covers 85% of the topics that show up on that test. Hong Kong, which happens to do their things in English, makes them good to study, typically gets one, two, or third, first, second, or third place on that test, omitting 45% of the topics that show up on that test. So the message is fewer things, deeper, was part of the design of the, the standards themselves, actually has an interesting impact. So not only shared standards, but the features of the standards themselves, I think we can talk about internationally benchmarked. This is part of what's been successful. Doing and not being afraid to measure up against a standard that's benchmarked internationally, I think is really important in the higher ed institutions, within their K-12 buildings, uh, allowing time for admi administrators and, and teachers to talk about instruction, what good instruction is. Um, I think that's critically important. And for Illinois, I mean, you don't find a lot of countries with 867 governing units. I'm just saying. We got it, <laughs> uh, you know, w with a disconnect. Got the right audience uh, to make that point. A disconnect between elementary and high school, districts that are completely different. I and mean, let's have an honest conversation about the cohesion of curriculum in those configurations and how do we make that happen. Um, it, it's really an important issue, an important issue for this state. I see other countries internationally thinking about 
those kinds of things to make sure our students getting the best. Look, I went to a county high school a district here in, in, in the state of Illinois. The same person that was teaching, you know, a lot of the, all the advanced math courses was teaching all the advanced science courses. Um, I probably didn't have an equivalent uh, education to someone going to some of the suburban high schools in Illinois. Uh, we have to be getting parents and everyone thinking about what are the offerings, what's there, what, are the, what, what, are, what does my student have access to that other students don't, and is it okay? And that's really what we have to do. Well, I would like you all please to join me for thanking Sandra Alberti and Dr. Chris Cook for joining us tonight. But I have a few additional thank yous and a closing thought. First of all, this is not my closing thought. I am, however, terrified. My children are now in high school and college, and I'm very pleased about that because if we made them any better at using evidence, I don't know what kind of devices they would have gotten at what ages. So be warned, all of you have young children, that the, 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 the arguments for smartphones and iPads is going to start younger and, and better. Um, but I want to thank a few other folks as well. First of all, again, thank you to CME Foundation for the support for um, the dinner here this evening. I want a huge round of thanks to Jim O'Connor on the Advance Illinois team and the entire Advance Illinois team for putting this together. Not only for tonight, but it takes a lot of effort to run uh, uh, Dr. Alberti around the state quite as broadly as she's been run around in the last 36 hours. But I, I want to I end by thanking those of you for who took time out of your schedules tonight, and particularly legislators, because you've got a lot on your plates. There are a lot of awfully important issues that we're addressing. I think all of you, I hope, know, believe, and understand that we've taken a lot of very important steps as a state on the education front over the last three, four, five years. But none is probably more central to all of that work than the Common Core Standards. And that doing that work well connects and makes possible all of the other work that is going on in schools and districts around. So it's critically important that we do this well. And we wanted to do everything that we could to make more information available to you. Because I promise you, whether you have a child currently in school or not, this is not the last time that you're going to hear about it. This has been dubbed, as you've heard, as the single most important educational reform in the history of American education. It's not going anywhere, and it's going to have profound implications on every other piece of, of what we're trying to accomplish to make college and career readiness a reality for every child here. So thank you for taking time to hear a little bit more about it. We know there are going to be lots more conversations. There are going to be times that we come back. I suspect there's going to be a conversation about technology needs in the state sometime uh, soon, which is not an easy one. I, I say that half jokingly, but very seriously. And in, in these economic climate, that's a real challenge. But you can see it's married up against a very real opportunity, not to mention what you can do once you get that in place. So this is the beginning of what will be ongoing conversations. Thank you for being good partners and for being here and for all of the other people who have co-hosted and co-sponsored the you know Ed Red thank you so much Lendon Scope P20 Council the Education Legislative Caucus the Voices for Illinois Children Ounce of Prevention Latino Policy Forum I feel like it's a rally and we should all start standing up <laughs> the parent you know the PTA which by the way the Illinois PTA has been out in front on Common Core if you had heard about Common Core before now odds are that it was because some hardworking person at both the National and the Illinois P the Parent Teacher Association has been working hard to make sure you do there's now a statewide collaborative trying to make information and materials available to schools and districts it's called common core ill I hate the way that sounds when I say it but common core il dot org great materials for you to download to make sure you've got information ready for your parents and teachers the United Way the I know I'm missing some, the IEA the IA the Illinois Association of School Administrators Illinois Education Association thank you thank you have a wonderful evening and I think we got you out exactly on time thanks yeah.